the teens or even in the 20s or in the 30s. So the number has to be reduced. I will give you the cause and uh, how it, uh, why it needs to be done. Then another wrong practice is a very early prescription of plus classes for, uh, for people who are in their 30s or 40s, uh, thinking that this is early presbyopia. This is totally wrong. So I, uh, this is my job to correct all these three malpractices or wrong practices or wrong beliefs and uh, have to clarify this concept. So the highlight of this talk is that wrong prescription of glasses results in headache, diplopia, dizziness, and strabismus. It can cause, wrong glasses can cause strabismus as I will show you. Correct glasses, on the other hand, they straighten the eyes in any non-paralytic strabismus if prescribed early before secondary muscle changes have occurred. So the uh, correct glasses can straighten eyes without surgery in strabismus of up to 15 degrees. So you don't need to do one muscle or two muscle surgery. 15 degrees of strabismus can be corrected just by correct glasses. So now coming on to a very important concept of convergence. Convergence is a necessity for binocular single vision throughout our life. When a baby is born, our eyes are uh, aligned uh, at a divergent angle in our bony orbits. So the first thing a baby, when he opens his eyes, is the need to converge. So like breathing center, cardiac center, convergence center has been found in the brainstem reticular formation. This is the brain stem, and this red line is the reticular formation in pons, medulla, and midbrain. And as soon as the baby opens his eyes, impulses go to the reticular formation and then to the, well, from the occipital cortex to the reticular formation and then to the uh, motility center and then to the eyes, and both eyes they converge. So when a baby, most babies, when they are uh, opening their eyes, they are not divergent. When they open, you see them straight. So from the position of divergence to straightening, convergence has occurred. A little bit of convergence has occurred. And when a baby is born, there is no macula. So the baby's vision is very hazy. So, but from the position of divergence in which they are lying in the bony orbits to straightening the eyes needs convergence. And this convergence only occurs if the baby has two seeing eyes. If vision in one eye is absent due to some sensory problem in the retina or in the media, then that attempt to converge will not occur and the baby will be born with one divergent eye. So that is a very important fact to remember. So why is convergence needed? Because both our eyeballs, both the macula, both the retinal elements, they have to be directed to one object in space. So one eye sees more of one object, then the other eye sees a little bit more on the other side. But these two images, they are very slightly different and they can be fused in the brain and this area is called the Panem's fusion area. So to see one image, both eyes have to converge and they have to look at the same object in space so as to fuse in the Panem's fusion area. And so we have a binocular single vision. So for binocular single vision to occur, we need conversions. And this convergence we need at all distances of gaze. So a baby who is born with an exotropia, either there is faulty convergence or there is a sensory deficit in the media or in the retina. So what is faulty convergence? Most of the babies, most of the infants, they have normal uh, media, normal retina, but convergence, it's the fault of the convergence that it hasn't developed. And why isn't it developed? It is to do with the convergence center that this convergence center in the brainstem reticular formation research has proven that it develops in the first trimester of pregnancy. 
like the cardiac center, the breathing center, this also develops in the first trimester of pregnancy. And if something happens to the mother during that period, any infection, high fever, hypertension, diabetes, then this center, the working of this center is altered. If the uh, maternal uh, blood flow is reduced to the baby's brain, then the, uh, the, the center fails to work at all and the baby is born with an exotropia. Similarly, during delivery, if something happens to the baby, uh, is breathing, there is asphyxia or there is hypoxia uh, during childbirth or during the first few weeks of life, then again, the working of this center is altered and the baby will be born with an exotropia. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, I'm uh, in my AT person practices pediatrics. So these, all these babies which come with a congenital exotropia, always, always there is a history that something happened to the mother or to the baby during the uh, childbirth or during the first week. The baby didn't cry after birth or was in the ICU and they all end up having an exotropia. So significance of convergence, it is the most important phenomenon for BSV. It is required for all kinds of work at all distances of gaze. It, so due to overuse, constant use, overuse or misuse throughout our life, it gradually reduces with age. And that is why most of the uh, teenagers are in their uh, 20s People, they, if you look at their eyes, you do the cover test, they almost all have exophoria or true exotropia. People in their 30s, if you look, see 100 uh, people, not even patients, in, in a public place, if there are 100 people you are of the 30s or 40s, they will all, all have exotropia to some degree, and that is due to convergence insufficiency. So convergence should not be weakened unnecessarily by too much plus correction or by too much medial rectus recession as surgeons. So this fact should be kept in mind by all ophthalmologists. So ocular motility balance, which has to be preserved in all directions of gaze so that both eyes move together in every direction, this is maintained by on one, hand, on one hand, convergence and accommodation, and on the other, divergence. So divergence phenomenon, the phenomenon of divergence is absent in the first 10 years of life. And it starts to develop around 10, 12, 13 in the teens. And then it becomes, rapidly becomes very active. And that is why we, this is the age group in which we find exotropia starting initially as an intermittent exophoria, that exophoria becomes larger and then it ends up having a true constant or alternating exotropia. And this is because the divergence becomes active after this age, while at the same time, accommodation and convergence, they are rapidly decreasing. After the age of 10, accommodation and convergence are rapidly decreasing. And this is not my graph, this is from Duke Elder, practice of refraction. The next concept is that of emetropization. Emetropization is a process by which I moves from the state of ametropia to emetropia. When a baby is born, the axial length is only 17 millimeter. So small eyeball, the image size is small and the details are hazy. And then the macula develops around three months of age. And so the maximum eye growth occurs between three to nine months of age. And this is the most important period or the critical period for visual development. So something must not happen during these three to nine months to hamper the uh, electrical signals going to the retina. If something happens during this period, then the vision will be uh, blocked and the baby will have amblyopia. And if it's not corrected, it will get denser and denser. And by one year of age, the eyeball and the brain, since eyeball is a part of the brain, so their growth goes together, it occurs together. So by one year, eyeball and the brain, they attain 85% of the adult size. 95% of babies are hypermetropic. 
at birth. But why one year only 45% are hypermetrope while the remaining 40 are emetrope. So this process of emetropization is very important to understand how it occurs because now in uh, this era, in the age, uh, in this uh, time, we are, the, we are entering into a myopia epidemic. And why is that? Because this emetropization has gone wrong. And this is, you will see why and how. So normally there should be less than 5% babies are myopic and then again, because of the process of emetropization, by six months, they changed to emetropia. But now it's not happening now. So blur signal is the stimulus for emetropization. And this signal is extremely important. So what is emetropization process? It is an active process and there is a passive component. So what is the active process? that blur signal because the eyeball is small sized in a newborn. So the image is blurred, the, uh, the uh, light rays, they are focused behind the retina. So the blur signal, it goes to the brain and then to the amacrine cells in the retina from the brain and the, uh, the amacrine cells release neurotransmitters which go to the Brooks membrane of rectal pigment epithelium and there is this feedback loop, the active feedback loop. So Brooks membrane in the RPE is the primary structure which uh, responds to this blurred image, blurred signal. And this Brooks membrane, it expands posteriorly. It uh, releases neurotransmitters which makes the choroid spongy. So as the Brooks membrane uh, expands posteriorly, it compresses the spongy choroid at the posterior pole and secondarily distends the sclera. So the sclera in a newborn is quite thin, so the sclera distends, it expands, and there is increased volume of sclera and then active formation of new scleral tissue, and so the eyeball grows till as long as the blur signal is no longer blurred, it is clear and clear, so this growth occurs till the blur image is there. So normally, uh, why doesn't this growth uh, extend further from emetropia towards myopia? Why is this block occurring? Because normally there is a balance between the axial growth and the uh, passive phenomenon, which is the flattening of cornea and lens. So active mechanism is the axial growth and then passively in response to this axial enlargement of the eyeball, there is flattening of the cornea and of the lens due to, that is in, due to the increase in the equatorial diameter and stretching of the zonules. So the lens flattens, its power reduces. And so the light rays are focused on the retina. And then once the blur signal is gone, then the further lengthening of the eyeball stops. So there is a rapid infantile phase for emetropization, which is, as I told you, in the first three to nine months. But and it continues till three years of age and uh, from 17 to 22 to 23 millimeters of eyeball growth occurs. And then there is a very slow juvenile phase from three to 14 years of age where axial length only increases by one millimeter. So retinal blur signal causes the release of neurotransmitters. And what are these neurotransmitters? Most important is this vasoactive intestinal polypeptide. VIP, it increases the choroidal blood flow. The choroid becomes thick, it becomes spongy, and it pushes and stretches the thin sclera outwards and the axial length increases. On the other hand, dopamine, it increases protein synthesis and proteoglycans in the sclera. So as sclera thickens, the axial growth stops. So these two are opposing hormones. Dopamine stops ag axial growth, VIP increases the axial growth. And then there is a third neurotransmitter or a hormone, which is melatonin. And melatonin is a very, very important uh, 
chemical stimulant that maintains the balance between VIP and dopamine. So all processes in the body, they are balanced and this balance should not be disturbed. And melatonin is the one that maintains the balance between axial growth and when the axial growth should stop. So if there is no melatonin, this balance goes haywire and myopia progresses. So what is melatonin and what does it do? It is released from pineal gland, which is a tiny gland uh, uh, present in the brain, uh, then uh, from the photoreceptors as well, in rods and cones, and from the ciliary body. So the amount released from photoreceptors and ciliary body is a little as compared, main uh, bulk of it is secreted by the pineal gland. And its secretion occurs in the dark. If there is light during sunlight, its secretion is inhibited. And in the dark, uh, what happens is that during, when it's the sleep time and uh, you're about to go to sleep, there is a sudden surge of uh, melatonin release. But if your sleeping time is delayed, for instance, you go to sleep at 10, and but you decide to see a um, watch a movie on, the, on your mobile phone or on the TV, and from 10 till 11 or 12, you are watching the video, that melatonin surge will not occur. And melatonin release during that night will be abolished. If there is no melatonin, then the brain will not go to sleep. You, you will lose sleep during that night. And then all the good things that melatonin does will be disturbed during that night. So what does melatonin do? It maintains the, our body's circadian rhythm. And what is that? It controls the intraocular pressures, diurnal variation, very important. It controls choroidal thickness, then sensitivity and renewal of photoreceptors. Again, photoreceptors, they are undergoing oxidation and they are undergoing degeneration. So this renewal of photoreceptors, it occurs in response to melatonin. It protects the lens and the retinal pigment epithelium from oxidative stress. And therefore it protects us from cataract, from age-related macular degeneration. And it promotes ocular surface healing. So if your sleep is disturbed, melatonin will not be released and all these functions, they will be disturbed. So sunlight, it stimulates the release of dopamine while melatonin is inhibited during the day. And at night, dopamine is inhibited while melatonin is released. And both these control circadian rhythm by having opposite effects. So exposure to bright lights at night, the short wavelength lights, LED screens, they emit blue light. And that blue light, it suppresses melatonin secretion. And brief exposure at night, it alters the circadian rhythm. It, uh, because of lack of melatonin, there is lack of sleep. There is a uh, lack of melatonin. There is promotion of axial growth and myopia. So then the yellow tinted lenses or blue light blockers at night, they increase melatonin and improve sleep and they have been used but it's important not to use uh, uh, these LED lights or the screens uh, uh, when it's your sleep time. And number two, even if you have to use it, use it in proper with proper room light, because if you see the screen in a dark room, then the pupil is dilated. And that mid dilated pupil, the, the, uh, these blue uh, Cones, they are they are absent at the fovea. The blue cones are present in the per, in the periphoveal area on the perimacular area. So these blue cones will uh, be stimulated by blue light only when the pupil is mid dilated, and the pupil is mid dilated only when the room light is dim, or you are trying to look at the screen in the dark. So if you are watching the screen in in a bright room, this will not occur. The other important phenomenon, as I said, the blurred signal that is causing the axial growth. So chronic image degradation promotes axial growth 
So as long as the image is clear, there is normal refractive development. And regulation of refractive development is independent in both eyes. One eye can have normal development, the other can, other eye in which there is something wrong in the media, that eye will, be the axial growth will continue. So the growth of both eyes is independent. One eye can become myopic, the other eye may be normal, absolutely normal, and that happens. So visual deprivation in the early months of life, in the first two, three years, it, like because of cataract, doses, ROP, PHPV, it increases the axial length and myopia. While myopia in premature babies is due to the short axial length, a baby's eye, a newborn, a newborn's eye is 17 millimeters. So a premature baby's eye is even smaller. And in them, the myopia is due to short axial length and steep cornea. So recovery occurs mainly by corneal flattening. And what are the changes that accompany increase in axial length? There is thinning of choroid and sclera, which is most pronounced at the posterior pole and less at the equator. Then the retinal thickness and thickness of Brooks membrane and RP cell density in the macular region is independent. So even in uh, high myopes, the macula may stay normal. An increase in the fovea optic dis distance is mainly due to enlargement of the parapapillary gamma zone because there is no Brooks membrane in that region. So that uh, enlargement also occurs here. So I hope up till now, this is all clear. And uh, we have discussed convergence, the importance of convergence, and we have discussed emetropization. Before I go on to the refractive errors, I'll ask Dr. Fatma if we have any questions. Um, no, Dr. Samira, so far, no questions. I think it's all very clear to them. <laughs> okay. I mean, seriously, so, it's going very well. I, I hope they're understanding. If they have any questions, I've already asked them. Please keep posting while the lecture is going on. So, okay. Dr. can throw questions. So, I, sh I should continue? I think you should. If you have any questions, people, so please write it down. I'm still looking at the chat box. There are no questions so far. Thanks very much. Okay. So, this is a very important graph for all of you who are going to write prescriptions. You have to remember this graph, the prevalence of refractive errors. So this graph is from Duke Elder. This is from 1950, and uh, uh, it's almost the same. And the, what it says is there's 90 to 95% hypermetropia in a newborn, and by age of one year, it sharply reduces to 40% only. And then in these 40% who stay hypermetropes, uh, which are uh, this hypermetropia increases only by very little 0.5 or one diopter till the age of four to five years. And then it starts to reduce. So this graph, and as well as this, look after the age of five, six years, there is a sharp decline in the incidence of hypermetropia. So this graph proves that there is no point in any patient to continue with their high plus classes. After the age of five, six, as uh, our ophthalmologists, as uh, clinicians, we must reduce the plus correction after this age. And uh, I will show you, if you don't reduce this correction, uh, the, the previous graph that I showed you that uh, divergence is increasing and convergence is reducing after the age of eight, 10, these are patients in whom you do not reduce the plus correction after this age. They, these patients will develop consecutive exotropia in, in their teens. And uh, then uh, it will be a dilemma how to correct them. So in every patient, th uh, this graph before prescribing the glasses should be kept in mind uh, because uh, whatever you are writing uh, the prescription for glasses, should be according to the age. If the patient falls in this age group, say five, six, seven, eight years old, then you have to give a minimum plus. Minimum plus that gives maximum vision because this plus is further going to abolish the convergence in that patient as well as accommodation. Both accommodation and convergence are reducing after this age. 
So a maximum plus is not needed at all. You have to give a minimum plus correction that gives maximum vision at the, after this age. Before this age, a patient may have esophoria or an esotropia, and then you have to give the maximum plus that makes the eyes straight. In this age group from zero till five or six, you have to have the eyes straight. If the eyes are not straight, there is no foveal fixation. If there is no foveal fixation, that eye will become amblyopic. So there is a difference in what you prescribe between this age group till from zero to six to five or six, and then the remainder of the age group from five or six onwards. So let's go on to the next. So another important point about lenses is that plus lenses, they relax accommodation. And because accommodation is linked to convergence, so they relax convergence as well. So plus lenses, they relax accommodation and convergence. On the other hand, minus lenses. Minus lenses, they induce accommodation. And along with that, convergence. So both these lenses have an effect on the ocular motility balance. So whatever prescription you're writing, and if you have not checked the uh, ocular motility balance that a patient has an esophoria or a tropia or an exophoria or an exotropia, and you have just written a number, that number is going to deteriorate the ocular motility balance. It will have definitely have an impact on the ocular motility balance. And in about uh, one to two months when the patient comes back to you, if there was a phoria, there will be uh, tropia, full, full blown tropia. So you must do a cover test and then decide what you're going to give a plus lens or a minus lens because of this. So this slide has this fact must be kept in mind while prescribing glasses. So another important point is, uh, so what they do is that uh, plus lenses, they relax accommodation and convergence and they bring the image closer to the nodal point. Nodal point is the center of the uh, uh, central point where the light rays, they travel without any uh, deviation. So the nodal point of a human eye is 17 millimeter in front of the retina. So in a small hypermetropic eye, since the image is focused behind the retina, so once the plus lenses are given, these plus lenses are converging lenses. They converge the light rays. Hey everyone, hello. Uh, Dr. Samira is having some connection uh, problem there. So there's some sudden power failure at her uh, site. So she's trying to reconnect now, okay? So please kindly wait. Hopefully she'll get back with us soon. Can you people hear me? 
Please acknowledge on text. Could you hear me? Thank you. Okay, Dr. Samir, Dr. Samir should be back soon. She is just establishing her uh, connection now. Should be the, um, should start. Should be convenient, like half a half a minute in a minute or so. Dr. Sama, can you hear me? Dr. Sama, you you saying there's no voice? Can you hear me? Can other people hear me or not? Okay, thank you. So, Dr. Uh, Samira should be joining again very soon. Let's just hang on there. Yeah, Dr. Samira is trying to uh, reconnect. She has some thunderstorm on her side. So we we'll, were just waiting for her. Welcome that. back. <laughs> My electricity went to oh God. There's such a thunderstorm here. It has to be today. Okay. So you see my screen now? Fatma, it's visible? Yes. Yes, it is. Screen share, slide sharing also. It's all okay. You can carry on. Thanks very much. Okay, so we were saying that plus lenses, they relax accommodation and convergence and bring the image closer to the focal point. So that, since that is the nodal point and the image is brought closer on the retina, so these plus lenses, they the image formed is magnified and real, okay? On the other hand, minus lenses, number one, they induce accommodation and convergence. And number two, the image normally in a myopic eye from near is focused uh, from far, the light rays are focused in front of the retina. So when we place a minus lens, it is a divergent lens, it diverges light rays. So these light rays are then brought to focus on the retina further away from the nodal point. So the image formed by a minus lens is small and it is in, inverted, okay? So these two are uh, different for plus lenses as, as well as minus lenses. So th that is an important point because the image formed by plus lens is always big and real. On the other hand, minus lens, it's a small image. So that has an important bearing on the patient. So what is a nodal point? Nodal point is a center point of the optical system in which an incoming ray directed at the nodal point leaves the system in the same direction. There is no change in direction. So this nodal point is not in the lens, but slightly behind the lens and about 17 millimeter in front of the retina. So now coming to prescription of glasses. When, do, when should we prescribe? So as I said, the first one year of life is the time when emetropization is maximum and it is in response to the blur signal. So we don't want to get rid of the blur signal if the patient, if the toddler has or the infant has no problem, no problem with the meaning there is no rubbing of eyes, closing of eyes, and, or uh, there is no strabismus then there is no need to give any refractive correction because we want the blur signal to stay there so the eyeball can grow towards emetropization. 
towards emetropia. If that blur signal is abolished too soon, the eye will not grow, I will stop growing. So in asymptomatic patients, asymptomatic babies, no need to correct refractive errors, provided they are orthophoric and they have a central, steady, maintained uh, light reflex on cover test, okay? So this you must ensure that they are orthophoric and with a, cent with a central steady and maintained reflex. There is no amblyopia. The sit media is absolutely clear. The retina is fine. So if a baby is brought to you by worried parents that both parents have wearing glasses or the mother has astrobismus and they want to make sure that the baby doesn't have it. So our, uh, often they bring uh, anxious young parents, they bring their babies. And so you have to reassure you, but you have must ensure that the baby is orthophoric with CSM and there is no problem in the media or in the retina. So a, a dilated examination must be done uh, with just a one or two drops of midrisal. So warning symptoms that the child needs glasses are closing one eye outdoors, rubbing eyes, Children, you, uh, if the vision in one eye is blurred, they just rub that eye. Then headache, eye strain, they stand close to the TV, especially myopic patients. They like to watch TV standing close to it. Or if the mobile phone, which parents are uh, in the habit of giving to the kids, they hold the mobile phone close as well. Then an, a, a strabismus is a bit delayed feature. These start occurring early, closing eye outdoors or rubbing the eyes and then strabismus develops. Pa parents are really late to note strabismus unless the eyes are really out or really in. They, they cannot detect an early strabismus. So this is a late symptom, late feature. And double vision, double vision, of course, where babies, they are uh, young children cannot complain of diplopia, but only uh, a bit sensible pair of patients. So uh, I uh, entered, uh, uh, added this slide of APOS guidelines regarding prescription of glasses. Actually, I, I don't uh, agree with this. It's because um, if you look at it, astigmatism, they no need to prescribe till three and uh, for, uh, for one year of age. And then minus 2.5 uh, equal to or more than 2.5 from one to two years and uh, from, uh, two to three years age, more than two, no need to prescribe glasses. They, they have said that diopters beyond which glasses should be considered. Now this range is also too high for me, this too. And they said they have written that only when hyper, uh, there is hypermetropia with esotropia, then more than two should be prescribed. Well, if the patient has esotropia, I differ in that, that if the patient has an esophoria or an esotropia, I would give even plus two, even plus one. I would not wait that this should increase and uh, the strabismus should increase. The longer you wait that uh, and without giving any correction, strabismus is going to increase. So I never uh, wait for this. That's why I don't agree with these. If the patient has an esophoria or an esotropia, I will give full correction. Irrespective, the child is one year, two year, three year. I, I will give any number. Similarly, if the child has an XT, exotropia, or even exophoria, even ex slight exophoria, and the child is rubbing the eyes or closing eyes outdoors, I will give you minus four, even minus two, minus three. So uh, unfortunately, I don't agree with this. It's up to you what you want to believe. But uh, you will see that uh, it, this doesn't hold. So how to assess a child or a patient who has come to you whether the child needs glasses and what to give? So whether the, uh, the child needs, if the child has all these complaints, then you have to do something. And what to give, what to give depends upon the age because age will guide you what you are going to give and then the cover test. Both these age and cover test, age you have to remember that graph, what you're going to give the convergence accommodation graph and number two, the prevalence of refractive error. Those two graphs should guide you what you are going to give that age group. 
And then the cover test should, should decide whether you're going to give a minus lens or a plus lens. And then so refraction. Refraction has to be done dry if the patient is an adult. You don't need to dilate. If it's uh, an exotropia you have to, or an exophoria, you have to dilate with cyclopen, cycloplegia. I'll give you the reason why. But if it is an esophoria or an esotropia, you cannot get away without doing cycloplegia with either home atropine or atropine. For esophoria or esotropia, it has to be with home atropine or atropine. But if it's an exo, then it is cyclopen. If it's an adult, then it's a dry refraction. Then subjective or postmidriatic is indicated in patients who are school going. If they are toddlers, or you can give safely whatever the reading has come. But in school going children, a postmidriatic refraction is a must. And then nothing short of a full ophthalmic examination. You have to look the, uh, at the whole eye. You have to look at the retina, at the macula. And you have to mention in the notes whether the fixation is foveal or eccentric. And foveal or eccentric fixation has an important bearing on the patient. So that has to be checked by an ophthalmoscope or on the slit lamp when you're doing a 90D examination. Just ask the patient to look at the slit beam and, uh, if, and see whether the slit beam is focused on the fovea. So uh, when the patient comes to you already wearing glasses, you have to see whether they are centered or not. This, these, uh, the child is looking from above the glasses. So what's the point of these glasses? Similarly, these, they are highly decentered. So if the, to look at the glasses and to correct them is our responsibility. It's not the responsibility of an optician. Only we can guide par parents that have the child must have proper glasses in which the pupils, they are in the center of the lens. These are okay, but uh, centration has to be done in which the optician or the optometrist, they should mark where, is, where the center of the pupil is. And that is the place where the center, the power of the lens should be. Because there is what is called the prismatic effect of lenses. And what is that? The, the rule is, Prentice's rule is that prismatic power of lens is equal to the distance from the optical center of the lens and times the dioptric power of the lens. So if the dioptric power is two, say this is plus two lens and say this is the center, and the pupil is actually two millimeter or three millimeter away from the optical center. So then two times 0.2 is the 2.2 uh, is the prism, uh, the prismatic power of that this uh, defocus is causing. So centration of lens is extremely important to avoid uh, such a patient will complain of headache, dizziness, and diplopia. They can. So this centration is extremely important. Also, if the child is looking, the uh, center is the plus two, the, because the lenses are, plus lenses are uh, biconvex, the maximum power of this biconvex lens is right in the center. And if the eyeball or the pupil is away from the center, then not only there is the prismatic power of the lens exerted, but also the child is looking through, not through plus two, but through 1.5 or one, one diopter. So this myth correction is not, the glasses are not correct. So this is our also our job to correct the frame, to look at the centration. So now coming on to the hypermetropia, the optics. Fatma, we are okay? Carry on. Yes, perfect. It was very well. Okay. I, I think everybody can hear you loud and clear. And we have some questions also coming. Okay, so I'll stop after hypermetropia and we can discuss those. Thanks. So uh, the optics are that in a normal lens, normal eye, normal patient, the light rays from distance, they are brought to focus on the retina. But in a hypermetropic eye, since the axial length is short, 
the rays from distance are focused behind the retina. For near, for near object, the, the person can accommodate. And so the, from for near distance, the light rays are focused on the retina and the for near that child, that patient does not have a problem. But for far, whenever he looks at the far, the image is blurred. So what that child does is to accommodate, increase the length's power. So with accommodation comes convergence. So not only the child accommodates, the child converges as well. And when he converges, so the esotropia develops. Initially it's an esophoria, but then when this, uh, if this condition is not corrected by a plus lens, then this esophoria will become esotropia and the angle of strabismus then keeps on increasing till someone gives a plus correction that uh, uh, alleviates this problem. So how much plus are we going to give? So now types of hypermetropia is that every muscle, every muscle has tone. So that muscle tone in the ciliary muscle that is for that cause that is about one to two diopters. So the latent hypermetropia, which is due to the tone, muscle tone of ciliary muscles is uh, one to two diopters. And this is relaxed only, only by atrophy. On the other hand, the remaining of the hypermetropia, which is by the solely by the accommodation process is uh, that is the manifest hypermetropia and that can be abolished by cyclopen. But cyclopentylate does not have any effect on muscle tone. So if you are in a patient who, is, who has esotropia and you are giving, uh, you are dilating uh, with cyclopentylate, then you are giving an under correction of one to two diopters depending upon how strong the muscle tone is. On an average, it is about 1.5 diopters. So every patient of esotropia in which you are giving your correction, then writing the number, the prescription of glasses with cyclopen, you are giving a reduced correction by 1.5 on average diopters. So that patient where, who has been given less correction those eyes will not be straight. There will be residual hypermetropia, residual uh, accommodation and convergence and residual esotropia. And if the eyes are not fully straight, the medial rectus are continuously contracting. They develop contracture, hypertrophy, and that patient will then develop an uh, uncorrected uh, esotropia and the and will end up having surgery. So if you want your patients to avoid surgery, you have to give a full atropine correction. Uh, so I hope that point is clear. Right, so now let's I will come to myopia uh, or, and the minus lenses a bit later. I have to tell you, explain you the optics. Okay, so um, just bear with me. Okay. This you understand that how plus lenses relax accommodation and convergence. In the brain, accommodation and convergence are linked. They are, to, you cannot break them. Accommodation, if the eye accommodates, it converges. If the eye converges, it can accommodates. If, you're, uh, if the per person is looking at far and then looking at ne near distance, then the, that uh, person is converging. If you're converging, then because in the brain, both accommodation and convergence are linked, so you are accommodating as well. So they go together, hand in hand. If you converge too much, if you bring the thing closer, very close to the eye, you are converging too much and then you are 
hyper accommodating and then if you people who are holding the cell phones very close or book very close and reading then they develop this accommodative spasm or spasm of convergence as well and uh, so accommodation convergence is totally linked when we come to the minus lenses i'll explain to you that why uh, it's the other way around so when you are giving the plus lens plus lens is magnifying the image so and it is adding to the power of the natural lens of the eye okay so that lens does not have to accommodate so if the accommodation is absent convergence is also relaxed accommodation relaxed convergence relaxed and so the in the hypermetropia plus correction will relax that now imagine and uh, this is all good for a patient who has an esotropia or an esophoria because we want to relax accommodation and we want to relax the convergence what happens a patient uh, with an exotropia comes to you and you do the refraction and uh, he's hypermetrope what are you going to do are you going to give plus to that patient to a hypermetrope no that if the refraction is he is a hypermetrope and he is if the, the child is xt he is the child has an exophoria or an exotropia and say uh, he has a hypermetropia of 5 6 or 7 even 9 would you give that would you give 9 to that child never what you will do is you had that reading you will not even give him atropine as well you will not give atropine retra- refraction to that patient who has an exo either an exophoria or an exotropia you will check the refraction by cyclopentylate because you are not never ever going to give the full correction that will make the exotropia even worse so cyclopen refraction and then you will do a post midratic test you will not give the reading say after cyclopen there is a reading of 5 or 6 you are not going to prescribe 5 6 to a child who has an xt you will wait 5 days for the cyclopen effect to uh, recover you will call the child after 5 days or one week and then you will give the minimum plus minimum or if he has a, a cylindrical error you will give the cylinder and you will try whether the child is better with the plus cylinder or the minus cylinder and so preferably in an xt you will give the child minus cylinder in the opposite meridian which i'll show you in a minute okay so now then child comes with congenital strabismus et or xt so they are both different conditions both different management so for et you have to exclude paralytic element similarly for an xt you have to exclude there is no paralysis and for that you have to abdu- uh, for et you have to abduct the eye fully for this child you have to fully adduct you show a toy in that direction and see if the eye comes in and you must see whether there are any changes in the palpebral aperture that there is no restrictive element to the strabismus like a duens okay so once you have excluded the paralytic element you have to exclude amblyopia and that you have to do by covering one eye and see a steady uh, fixation in the opposite eye if there is no amblyopia in this patient you will give a full atropine uh, 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 you prescribe atropine eye drops or ointment and call the patient after 3 days for babies it's a must that you give prescribe ointment 1% ointment and uh, that has to be instilled while the baby is asleep at night and then in the morning so just twice a daily and for 3 days third day you, uh, i generally never ever give a ga i sedate them with chloral hydrate till the age of 2 i sedate them in the clinic with chloral hydrate syrup and uh, then do the refraction uh, then uh, to this baby i will give the full atropine correction and ask the parents to do abduction exercises and then follow up regularly on the other hand the child with an xt once i have excluded that there is no paralytic element no restrictive element 
the media is clear, the fundus is absolutely normal, no macula or retinal optic nerve problem. I will give these cyclo, I will do the cyclopen refraction. And this cyclopen refraction, I will try to give the minus cylinder if there is any, if there is only plus one, two, three, or four, I will not give. I will just leave it at that. And then this child will need surgery later on, say about when the child is 18 months. So as steropsis to develop, because at 18 months, steropsis develops. But if they, this eye is, looks like that it is a constant XT, then I will advise patching of this good eye so that this eye straightens up. Okay, and then again, regular follow-up. On the other hand, the child is four to five years. The child is brought to me four to five years of age with an ET. So of, if this ET has been there, of course, uh, this kind of strabismus, if it wasn't congenital, this starts around the age of one to two years when the child, uh, the uh, horizon of a one to two year old child is uh, uh, for a near, near work mostly. And uh, nowadays, parents are in the habit of giving them just cell phones. So they are all the time on the cell phones. And this, uh, because of constant near work, the eye goes in. So again, a full uh, atropine uh, refraction will be done. And the child at the age of four will be given a full correction so that he is orthophoric with the glasses. For instance, the and why now coming to why uh, atropine refraction and why not cyclopen refraction for hypermetropia or an ET? It's because say for instance, there is an uncorrected hypermetropia. In an uncorrected hypermetropia, the, the, it, this eye is not fixating at the fovea, but the fixation is extra foveal. The fixation is temporal to the macula. So if this eye is not fully straight by the glasses, then that extra foveal fixation will remain, okay? This extra foveal fixation, this will not be corrected if two third of hypermetropia is corrected. If with the glasses, there is a residual ET, then the eye, that eye, which is not straight, it is not the, uh, achieving a foveal fixation, but still it is the light rays are projected at this extra foveal area. And the visual potential at the extra foveal area can never be 6'6. 6'6 vision, visual potential is only of the fovea. So if the esotropia is not fully corrected by giving a two third hypermetropic correction, then there is extra foveal fixation. The vision will never be 6'6. The ET will never be corrected. That medial rectus will develop contracture, hypertrophy, and uh, that will be uh, you, the, every, the, usually the ophthalmologist, they label, uh, label that person as uh, not fully accommodative ET, partially accommodative ET. I mean, to me, partially accommodative ET is self-induced when you are not giving a full correction. So only full cyclopean plegic correction ensures foveal fixation and straight eyes and a 6-6 vision. So this has to be fully corrected, full hypermetropic correction, including the of the latent hypermetropia as well, has to be given. And that can only be possible with atropine refraction, not with cyclopentylate. I hope that point still is clear and uh, people will start altering their practice. Then along with giving glasses to all these kids, you have to correct their posture. Prolonged near work and bending or stooping while doing their homework, while doing writing. Their children, they are, they are in the habit of bending their heads and stooping while doing their homework. This has to be stopped because what happens is too much close work 
increases the accommodation. As you bring the, uh, as you are bending, you are reducing the distance from 33, normal 33 near distance, uh, uh, your working distance of 33 centimeter, to, you are bringing it closer. So as you bring the books closer by bending the head down, you are increasing the accommodation demand, increasing convergence and increasing isotropia, as well as inducing astigmatism. Children are usually the habit of bending their heads like this and doing their homework or, and, or reading. So that causes eye strain and astigmatism and then the blur signal and that blur signal will result in myopic progression. So if the book is brought closer to 33 centimeters, the, the lens will accommodate more. And when it accommodates more, its power increases and it will bring the near light rays to focus in front of the retina. And that is the blur signal and that will result in hypermetropia changing to myopia and that will increase. The cycle towards myopic progression will increase until and unless you correct this posture, straight head posture and the distance, working distance of 33 centimeter. So unless this is done, the myopic progression or esotropia or any kind of refractive error will not be corrected or uh, even exo exotropia as well. So a straight head posture, correcting, telling uh, to parents, teaching the child is our job as well. So the questions that the parents ask normally, why did that child develop strabismus? I hope you can answer that because it's mainly refractive. It's not a muscular problem. Most ophthalmologists are in the habit of telling the parents that it is a muscular problem. It's not. It's never a muscular problem. It's almost always a refractive problem. But unless you correct that refractive problem, it increases, increases with time, and then it becomes a muscular only when this medial rectus develops a contracture or hypertrophies. Then they ask, often ask, will the vision be okay? Yes, if the child has been given proper glasses, the vision will be okay. If the retina is all right, there is no impediment to improving vision. And if the glasses are given, they normally ask how long the child will be given glasses, how long is it for life. In hypermetropia, you can safely say that the child will have glasses, the number will slowly increase till the age of four or five, and then the hypermetropia will go on reducing till by the age of 10, 11, 12, the child will be off glasses provided there is no astigmatism. Then another question they frequently ask, will he need surgery in hypermetropia? If it is fully corrected, ET is fully corrected, surgery is not an option, not indicated at all. So partially accommodative ET, as I said, if the child has been given refraction after cyclopentolate correction, so it's two third hypermetropia has been corrected, then the medial rectus continues to stay contracted, and that I will become amblyopic as well. And then that child will need surgery. So you have to correct the amblyopia and you have to correct, uh, give full correction. And then maybe that I will straighten up. So this graph shows you that how accommodation and convergence goes on reducing with age. And this is an important graph to remember. So it decreases with age as well as the convergence. So after the age of say 10, the accommodation and convergence rapidly reduces. And that is the time that in teenagers or in early 20s, uh, patients, they start having uh, asthenopia and uh, the eye uh, starts to diverge. There is initially exophoria and then tropia. And so all these patients with exotropia, they uh, come in this period when the Convergence is reducing, but at the same time, divergence amplitude is increasing. So another patient now, age 12 and still wearing plus 4.5 since the last two years. So look at the eyes. So that eye is going out. 
So many patients, they walk into my clinic with such kind of glasses, 4.5 not being reduced for the last two years or three or four years. So the eye develops a consecutive exotropia. And this is because of us not reducing the plus correction with age. So in this patient, if there is no amblyopia, then what needs to be done is gradually reduce the plus correction. From 4.5, if the child has come to you today, I will reduce the correction by 3.75 or 4. And okay, then... Yeah. After... Yes? Sorry to interrupt, but somebody has requested to, if you could repeat the last slide, please, the graph one. Okay. Um, thank you. This graph. Like yeah. at the age of 6 to 10 years, the, the mean amplitude of uh, this accommodation is 14. It's maximum around the six to 10 years. After 10, there is a sharp decline. And that is a time period when all the exotropias, exophorias come. And usually uh, these patients who are in their 20s, 30s, they go to an optician. They have, because both eyes are diverging, most of these patients, this is their active working life. They go, to, uh, they start having problems of asthenopia, headache. They keep on working for long hours on their computers or reading and one eye is straight, the other eye is out. And with continued close work, the eye goes out and out and they start having headaches and eye strain. They go to optician. What an optician does or even many ophthalmologists they prescribe plus glasses at this age. So plus glass, of course, I told you, they magnify the image. They will make the image big and you are checking each eye separately. So the image is big, patient is happy, yeah. They go home and now they have to see with both eyes. So the plus glasses that you have given to this patient age 26, 30 or 35, that plus glass will relax accommodation. Whatever accommodation that the patient had, you have reduced even more. And convergence reduced even more by your plus correction. The eye will go out and the patient's problems, they will not be solved. And had an exophoria initially, that you experience breathing, and uh, that patient will not forgive you. So, okay, going on to now, this you understood, I hope, that any patient who, who has been given plus correction after the age of five or six, plus has to be reduced. On every follow up, there should be regular follow up. Uh, the refraction should be repeated every six months, twice a year. The atropine refraction has to be repeated every six months, not three months, four months, six months. And in between, if you see the patient, then before give, uh, dilating, before dilating the pupils, you must do the cover test and see if the child with the glasses on is developing exotropia or exophoria then you have, you are not going to increase this plus correction, you have to reduce. If you do not reduce the plus correction when the child had an exophoria, then they will end up with this picture of true exotropia. And that is very bad because this is going to progress. If you, go, if you do surgery for this, your surgery will fail. Can you ask Fatma, can anyone tell me why will surgery fail in this condition? Child is wearing 4.5. It, eye is going out, and if you do surgery in this, uh, total failure. So you, you give me the answer, ask them. <laughs> okay, if um, I'm waiting for our replies, okay, here. Um, no reply so far. <laughs> okay. Let them think about it. Now, another case, this child had an uh, esotropia surgery at age three. Now she's 14. She was three. She had a uh, plus correction as well, hypermetropia at that age too. But the surgeon never bothered to reduce the plus correction after the surgery. 
ET surgery, of course, the child had a bimedial recession. Medial recti were weakened. Look, and Samira, then, there's, okay, uh, there's, there's an answer. Question. Yeah, there's a reply. Dr. Royala uh, says, because, because of extra foveal fixation, surgery will fail. And yeah. Dr. Basin Heather says the same, sure surgery will fail. <laughs> Royla, wrong answer. It's not the extra foveal fixation that's going to uh, cause failure. It's because in exotropia, these plus classes, these plus classes are relaxing the medial recti because I've just explained to you, plus classes, they relax accommodation, relax convergence, okay? And now in, in an exotropia, you have to tighten this medial rectus and relax the lateral rectus to bring the eye in. But would this eye bring a, a, come in by tightening the medial rectus while as long as she's wearing the plus correction? It will never, these are two opposing in, uh, forces. You, the plus glasses are relaxing the medial rectus by surgery, you are trying to bring the eye in by tightening the medial rectus and relaxing the laterals. This eye will never stay in because medial rectus, well, no matter how much surgery you do, it will be relaxed. It will not bring the eye in. So that is why the surgery will fail. Answer to, to this patient's problem is to gradually get her off these glasses. So you cannot get rid of these glasses straight as soon as she comes to clinic because she, uh, the whole optical system is used to wearing plus 4.5. So it has to be a gradual process. Every two or three months, you have to reduce 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. So it will be many visits, but then ultimately she will be off these glasses. So technically, if you are doing surgery in uh, patients with an ET, like in this case, that she had surgery, but she continued to wear this correction. And now look at that, the eye is going out. So in, after surgery, every surgeon must reduce the plus correction gradually. If there is a cylinder, that cylinder has to be changed to minus. So minus 1.5 at 180 and no spherical. So that, but again, this has to be gradual. Every two, three months, you reduce, reduce gradually. And along with this, convergence exercises, and that's it. No XT surgery, no second surgery is needed in this case. All you need to do is get her off these plus classes and convergence exercises. Okay. So now, next case. Age 12, vision 6-9, Exophoria for near, but for far, there's a large XT and she has a refraction of plus 2.5 at 90, which makes her 6.6. Six. So would you give that? She's already out, uh, eyes out for far. So ask them, uh, who's going to give plus 2.5? <laughs> they should better commit. <laughs> <laughs> no response so far. Okay, yeah, I'm looking for the answers. I'll skip the answer. We'll come back to it later. So, okay. So now I'll come to astigmatism. Cylinder prescription depends again. It should depend again on ocular deviation. You are giving a cylindrical prescription. It should depend upon again cover test. Cover test you decide you are giving plus cylinder or minus because to the eye's optical system, if you are giving a cylinder the first time, it does not matter whether, whether you give plus or minus in one meridian or the other. So if the child or the patient, even the adult has an ET, you will give a plus cylinder, no problem. But if the patient has an XT, then you have to give a minus cylinder if you are giving the first time. Why? The minus cylinder will correct the uh, one meridian. And then that will make the eye accommodate more. Uh, I'll go to it in a minute. So, and if there is a mixed astigmatism with plus sphere and minus cylinder, you will only give the minus cylinder and the plus will be corrected by the lens, which will accommodate more and that will be sorted out. So- Dr. Sadia says, transpose and give minus 2.5 cylinder. 
excellent she is a good girl so <laughs> what she was giving plus two, she was wearing plus 2.5 so with plus 2.5 look at that the eye is still going out and it's again in the clinic when we put minus 2.5 in the opposite meridian the eyes are straight okay so this gives you the magical answer that in a patient who has an xt and who has come for the first time you can easily play with the cylinder you can instead of this which is her refraction you should give her the minus which actually straighten the eyes and improve her vision as well all right this is going to if you cover her one eye this eye is covered and you are checking the vision monocularly this eye will be 66 but it is out and when she will continue to wear these glasses the exotropia will continue to increase that i will go out even more and the vision will reduce because it will become amblyopic gradually so the answer is to give minus that will straighten the eyes and improve the vision as well similarly another patient t an adult say to in his 20s wearing plus 2.5 and plus 1 i mean these are very common scenarios that mostly ophthalmologists they fail to remove this uh, hypermetropic correction they have no idea how what harm it's causing look at the eyes they are going out so in the clinic i removed his plus and just gave him the cylinder in uh, plus cylinder his vision was fine so we re uh, removed the sphere gave him the cylinder and then after 3 months or 4 months i'll change the cylinder to uh, minus at 70 minus cylinder at 70 so the eyes will be straight along with this he will do convergence exercises and should be fine no need to do any surgery or anything Okay, Fatma, you look disturbed. Is it okay? No, no, it's fine. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So now coming on to the optics of myopia. So what myopia? What happens is far, far in a normal person, far rays which are straight, they are focused on the retina. But in a myo, far rays be because the axial. It's usually myopia is usually axial. so axial length is large so the far rays they are brought to focus in front of the retina and the image is blurred and if this blurred image is not corrected then this myopia will keep on progressing and that is the reason why myopia uh, if it's uncorrected early continues to progress then for what happens to this myope for near for near the rays are divergent for when you are looking at a near object the rays are divergent for far object the rays are parallel so these divergent rays they are brought to focus on the retina and for near that person is fine so very high hyper uh, myopes they ultimately they develop an esotropia because they they are all the time looking at near they never look far because far vision is always blurred so if a person is point has a myopia of 0.5 diopter then his vision is clear for 2 meters to a distance of 2 meters it is the reciprocal distance if the person yes sorry 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 to interrupt again but i think you have to go to case 5 again because dr rayala wants to know can we give spherical equivalent prescription in case 5 it doesn't matter it won't help what would be the spherical equivalent what does she want to give ask her what does she want to give yeah i'm waiting for a reply <laughs> dr royala spherical equivalent she says i mean to remove cylinder to remove the cylinder no way you cannot remove the cylinder astigmatism look why why we cannot remove a cylindrical because our optical system is not perfect our cornea the cornea is anterior surface of cornea and posterior surface of cornea there is some uh, refraction diffraction diffraction there 
then uh, if the pupil is dilated then uh, a rays they pass through periphery of the lens as well so that causes some uh, aberrations okay and so point image point image is never a point image on the retina because of our faulty it is not 100% perfect optical system because of aberrations induced by the anterior and posterior surface of cornea and by the pupil edge of the pupil and the center of the pupil and then edge of the lens and the center of the lens so point image is never point and in addition to that if the person has astigmatism so imagine that that point image is again that enlarged so that blur signal the blur circle is enlarged so the point is no longer point in astigmatism it is a blurred circle and if you don't correct that blurred circle with the appropriate glasses uh, that patient will become amblyopic so cylindrical error even 0.75 you have to correct because for near whenever they read for distance it's okay but for near they will start having asthenopic uh, symptoms so cylindrical error you cannot ignore you have to correct one, even 1 2 3 any error cylinder you cannot ignore but that you have to decide whether it's a plus or a minus depending upon whether it's uh, et or xt so we were on myopia that if it the person is one uh, diopter myopic he can see clearly for 1 meter but beyond 1 meter the vision will be blurred and if it's a two diopter then half meter distance per uh, person can see and if it's a three so in high myopes there is esotropia so uh, i have told you in esotropia you have to give plus glasses but in this scenario with the high myopia with an et you have to give the full minus correction that minus lens will correct the myopia will make the convergence relax because if the myopia is say so for four or five diopter so the person when he will wear those four or five diopters he can look far at 5 meter or 6 meter distance clearly and that will relax his accommodation that will relax the convergence and uh, will correct the esotropia okay so i hope that's clear so this is one instance high myope uh, with an esotropia where minus correction is given always 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 another important problem that i told you at the start of the lecture is that for near in adults no one reduces minus correction after the age of 20 and i'll tell you why this is a wrong practice in children children should be at the same glasses for near and far and for near a distance of 33 cm must be maintained children should never work or children uh, not only children any person they should not hold the cell phones like this so 33 cm distance is a proper working distance or even more that is appropriate but never less than this and in adults always reduce minus fair for near after the age of 20 because again accommodation and convergence is reducing after the age of 20 remarkably so you the pers adult cannot wear the same correction for near as well so now let me explain to you so in myopia for far the focal point is in front of the retina and for but for near the rays are divergent as I, as i showed you previously and these divergent rays for near are brought to focus on the retina so for near that myope does not have any problem at 33 cm but for far depending on the myopia uh, the vision is blurred so so uh, this is for far minus 2 the rays are brought to focus on the retina but that adult for near does not need glasses because for near he is already fine okay but if he begins to hold the cell phone or the computer or the book closer than 33 cm then what happens too much near work 
the lens will accommodate. If the book or the gadget is brought closer to the eyes, that will induce convergence and convergence will induce accommodation. The lens power is increased. So the image is brought to focus in front of the retina. And this will again cause the blur signal. And this blur signal in this adult 20 or 30 year old will continue to increase myopia at this age. This is happening. I mean, many patients, they come in the 20s and 30s and there is a myopic progression at that age. And this is the reason because they are doing too much near work for long hours and this is exhausting the convergence and accommodation and making the blur signal work again. So this blur signal, you have, to, if you want to get rid of myopic progression, you have to get rid of the blur signal. So what happens for near? As I told you in adults, you have to reduce minus correction because they are at 33 centimeter, they are using a little bit of accommodation and they should, the, the minus correction should be reduced. In children, for near, if the child is given minus two for distance, for near minus two should be given as well because they have a very strong system, very strong accommodation. So no matter what you do for, uh, for near, their convergence is in action and so is accommodation. So already for near, the lens power is increased. So if the in internal inherent lens power is more and the child is, giving, uh, is wearing minus two, so that will negate this high lens power. Minus two concave lens will negate the accommodated lens power for near in a child. So this minus two in a child will be worn for distance as well as near. But in an adult at 33 centimeter, the accommodation is being reduced. So you don't need minus two for near in an adult. You have to give less. If the, for instance, the adult has a myopia of minus six, minus seven. So at 33 centimeter distance, you have to give six or five, one diopter less because the lens is not that much accommodating. But for a child, you will, the child will be at the same power for both near and distance. Okay, I hope that's clear. And then we are coming to early presbyopia. As I said, this early presbyopia, patients are coming at the age 35, 40, 45 with XT. If you look at their eyes, their eyes are going out and they bring a, a whole bag of glasses, plus one, plus two, plus three, given by optician, given by optometrist, given by ophthalmologist, and they are very unhappy patients. And why is this happening? They come with eye strain, blurring of vision, exotropia, reduced convergence. And if, when they are given the plus correction, it will further reduce their convergence and accommodation amplitude. So all they need at this stage when they come to you is only convergence exercises. That's it. You do the refraction and uh, if they have a cylindrical error, all you need to do is prescribe the minus cylinder and give them convergence exercises. That's it. No plus classes at this stage. Even till the age of 55, you, you don't need really a press biopic correction. Because as I said, if you look at this graph, after the age of 20, uh, this, uh, this accommodation amplitude and convergence is sharply declining. So around the age of 20, if everybody starts doing convergence exercises, this stage will not occur. And presbyopia can be delayed for more than 55, age 55, even till 60, you can delay presbyopia. Because the lens changes, they do not start at 35 or 40 or even at 50. The lens changes start after for a 50. And that hard lens that has absent accommodation that usually happens around 60 or 60 plus. So why is everyone prescribing plus glasses at this age or at this age? Why, I mean, I, I fail to understand. 
and patients these are very very unhappy patients who have us a uh, bag full of glasses plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and they are unhappy with all kinds of glasses so i hope this message is loud and clear so all these patients they are happy taking off their glasses and reading or squeezing their eyes so all you need to do is look cover and cover test look for abnormal head posture measure their convergence distance accommodation amplitude ocular motility and just give them exercises that's it nothing else right so this brings us to the end and i hope uh, some messages some um, the concepts are clear that patient's age and cover test should decide as to what and how much should be prescribed so without doing a cover test you should not write a prescription i mean that is absolutely criminal because this one prescription uh, this will continue for years and years like if first person sees a glaucoma patient and starts him on anti glaucoma drugs no one is going to remove those uh, or challenge that prescription they will just keep on okay continue anti glaucoma anti glaucoma Similarly, one pair patient is given a glasses by an optician or an ophthalmologist without performing the cover test. These wrong glasses, they will continue and they will cause secondary changes, as I said, as I've shown you in all these pictures, that they will cause secondary changes in the muscles and the muscle balance and the eyes will go out. So this is really bad. So must always do a cover test. before writing a prescription you must always keep in mind the graph of refractive errors and accommodation convergence divergence what what's happening at that particular age where is that patient according to that graph uh, on according to the age on that graph then minimal near visual activities and screen time this is this is our job to advise the patients and the parents that the children they have proper posture while reading they have minimal near activities the reading time for every person should be 40 minutes 40 minutes and followed by a break of 10 15 minutes uh, patients or even uh, children adults anyone they should not be on the screen for hours and hours are holding a book for hours and hours every 30 to 40 minutes there should be a break of 10 minutes and that will maintain the convergence and accommodation amplitude so this has this is our job as ophthalmologists to tell our patients posture uh, screen time reading time and proper sleep routine because you know now melatonin is such an important uh, hormone and it maintains this circadian rhythm one day lack of sleep will totally the circadian rhythm will be out for 2 to 3 days so this is also important proper sleep routine minimal near visual activities a uh, problem of what's happening is that we are taking shortcuts we want atropine uh, 0.001% to correct the myopic progression it will not do it unless unless you have corrected the posture you have reduced the near visual activities reduced screen time and you have induced proper sleep routine unless the cause is removed cause is corrected atropine or lenses or they will not uh, halt myopic progression and one day will come that all the generation generation will be with thick glasses two postures Uh, uh sullen complexions because they are uh, indoors all the time hooked on to their screens they don't want to go out nobody wants to go out so this will happen the whole population will be like that with thick glasses bad postures and bad complexions bad health unless we do something now so it's i think everybody's job to teach the parents teach the patients that proper posture proper sleep routine proper screen time and proper reading habits 
So if the patient is symptomatic, but orthophoric, you have to give a minimum correction, minimum. That gives maximum vision, whether it's plus or minus. After the age of six, seven, you should not think of given plus correction. No, and there's no point unless there is a slight esophoria. And that esophoria can, is mainly after the age of six and esophoria is mainly because children are using too much near work. You abolish the near work, that esophoria will disappear. It will not go on to an esotropia. Nowadays, many patients are coming around the age six, 10, 15, sudden onset of ET. And that sudden onset of ET is mainly because they are doing too much near work, too much screen time. So the convergence, it just, uh, it goes into spasm and a sudden ET. So you block their near work with atropine and uh, block the, and give slight plus glasses, it will be corrected. So under the age of five with an ET, you give full atropine refraction or home atropine. After the age of five, you must do a post midriatic correction and give a maximum plus. So once you've given appropriate glasses, you need to reassess the patient after six weeks. And- uh, Dr. Samira? Yes. Sorry, there's a question. Um, a question from uh, Dr. Sobhya Shah. An XT with plus refraction and no cylinder. Should we prescribe reduced plus correction? No, no. <laughs> you only give convergence exercises. I mean, uh, okay, ask her. Six nine six or six six partial. They cannot be six eighteen in that eye. If it's six eighteen, then that is amblyopic eye. So amblyopic, totally different management. That I haven't covered because that's a whole topic. I can't cover in this. The reply says uh, uh, 618, age in is 12 eye. years. In one eye. I think so, yes. 618 vision. Hmm. So an amblyopic eye, that is a totally different management. So if one eye is 66, the other is 618 with plus correction. Somebody, nobody ever gave that child a plus correction. So in that case, you have to uh, do patching one eye and give the plus correction. And once the amblyopia is corrected fully, then you gradually reduce the plus and get her off the glasses. So that's uh, how it's done. But now she says, case, you have uh, in the XT with plus, it becomes six nine partial. Yes. So give her six nine. I'll give her the plus correction, see her, the patient in about six weeks. If she comes to six, six, in the meantime, you must prescribe her uh, uh, these convergence exercises. So with glasses off, she should converge and convergence exercises, they should be done properly. Uh, I, I see many, um, even doctors, the ophthalmologists, they come to me with their kids and they're not they don't even know how to do proper convergence exercises. So that has to be done properly. You have to teach the patients how to do it. And the way to do it is hold a, hold a pencil or a pen at eye level and bring the pen closer, keeping it focused so that both eyes, till the tip of the nose, both eyeballs go in and count five. And then start again and then five, one, two, three, four, five. So that's the way to do it. So and, and anything short of this uh, is not a correct convergence exercise. So in your patient, you have to give the plus correction and tell her to do these convergence exercises three times, 20 times morning, 20 times afternoon, 20 times evening, after taking the glasses off, with the glasses off. If it's a myo, amblyopic, XT, or uh, XT with a myopic, then uh, that person has to do convergence exercises with the glasses on because the minus lenses, they lead to uh, convergence and accommodation, okay? Uh, should, Dr. Samira, should she build it up for starting from five in per sitting, then increasing it gradually to 15 and then 20, or can she start from 20 only? 
convergence exercises. Yeah, I'm mean, just saying. Oh, huh? Exercises look whenever uh, it's done for the first time, it will cause slight uh, headache, slight headache. Mm -hmm. But that you have to explain to the patient that once uh, you do exercise, uh, like walking, even if a person hasn't done hasn't walked in his life, and you start walking or running, first day or two days, there will be a little bit of cramps, muscle cramps. So, but it's for your own good. So, okay, you can reduce it to say 10 times a first day and then gradually build it up, but not for weeks or months, over weeks or months. But it has to be done properly and three times and uh, with the plus correction. And once the vision is 6-6, six, six, then it's the doctor's job to gradually reduce the plus and get her off those. And if it's a cylinder, then change the cylinder to minus. Otherwise, that's okay. three Sorry. Some of the participants were just requesting that they have to leave for namaz. They're from other uh, places. So they're requesting if you could uh, just upload this afterwards. And most of them are just constantly, they are thanking you for a very nice presentation. Okay. I'll, I'll upload it, inshallah. I'll, I'll do it. So just let me finish. Um, so. So when you give appropriate glasses, you have to reassess the patient after six weeks. Whenever you give glasses, reassess after six weeks, whether it's amblyopic or not, whether ET or XT. What you have to see is that after six weeks, the frame is proper. There is proper centration of the glasses. And then number two, whether the uh, eyes are straight, orthophoric. If they are not, then you have to do something about it. If your prescription is not correct or uh, they are not uh, wearing the proper uh, correction. So six weeks is very important. And if it's an amblyo, then after six weeks, then you've given the glasses and the vision is reduced in one eye, then you at that stage, you have to start patching off the good eye and uh, so that the vision improves. And then at every visit, say six monthly visit, if the uh, on cover test, whenever a patient comes to me, I mean, the first thing I do after vision is we have to do the cover test and see whether the with the glasses on, the patient's eyes are going out or in or wherever they are. And if they are, if the patient is wearing plus correction and the, there is a slight exophoria, I, at that stage, I will reduce the plus correction on that visit. And that's how it's done. So uh, my, if is, the patient is myopic, then children should be at the same uh, uh, number for near and far. For adults, you must reduce for near and teach them proper posture, proper reading distance. This has to be, this is a must. Proper posture, proper reading distance. If you want your patients, that myopic progression should stop. Giving them atropine, low dose atropine will not solve the issue because you have not taken care of the cause. If the cause is there, no matter what you do, myopia will keep on progressing. So convergence exercises should be done by everyone after the age of 20. If you want to delay presbyopia, it's a must for everyone because that is the normal physiology, the muscle power is reducing gradually. So you can reduce presbyopia and you can delay it for years and years. Thank you. All this is given in this book. So if you want, I can send it to you. So any other question? <laughs> I, think I don't think so. <laughs> okay. There are no more questions. Okay. Thank you Thank so much, you. Dr. Fatma, for giving us so much. It was my pleasure. Thank and you very much. I hope this was a worthwhile effort. It definitely and was. And everyone is appreciating one after the other. Thank you, madam. And an excellent, very informative lecture by Dr. Ash uh, Ashwani. Dr. Sobia says, thank you very much. And then Dr. Sadia says, excellent talk, Dr. Simi, and so on. Thank you very much, Dr. Samira. Okay, then. So nice of you. Thanks, Fatma. Thank you, uh, Mr. Daryal uh, from Alag for arranging this, for giving me opportunity to, you know, talk to my all my students and all the doctors out there.
Because this is thank such you. an important topic. Dr. Samir, there's a question. Sorry, there's just a, there's a question here. It says, uh, thank you, ma'am. Can you please guide regarding astigmatism without strabismus? For example, a six-year-old child with similar autograph reading, as AR reading of plus 0.25 spherical and minus 2.50 at 172 in both eyes. Cyclorefraction and PMT was done. Uh, and the child is reading 6 6 partial with minus 1.5 at 171. So good, give it. What's the problem? I mean, cylindrical error for a child till the age of 10, you can just give it. The optical system, it, it, it is so pliable. Um, uh, usually, uh, patients they come to me that the, uh, their uh, ophthalmologist has prescribed less, though there was more a refractive error. So if you are prescribing less and that is not improving the vision, what, what's the point in giving less? For, till the age of 10, you, you can give anything and the optical system will accommodate. And the vision, uh, what you have to do at this stage is you have to improve the vision and you have to make the eyes straight. If the vision is less, that I will never be straight, that I will diverge. And I will only remain straight if vision in both eyes is equal and they can look at the Panem's fusion area and fuse the images. If vision in one eye is less because of any reason, that I will deviate. So what's the point? As the deviation increases, uh, extra foveal fixation sets in and myopia sets in and refractive error will continue to increase in that eye. So just give your cylinders whatever you get. Okay, there's another question now. Um, I don't know the sender's name. It says, if there is plus number in autoref and cover test shows exophoria, so which number should I prescribe, minus or plus? I always ask the age. You have to look at the age. If the age is six, don't give plus. Already convergence is down, going on the down. If it's a one-year-old or two-year-old, then yes, or three, four, even four-year-old, then you give that minimum plus, minimum plus that gives six, six. Okay. And there's one more question then. Uh, does, this is from Dr. Mavish, uh, does astigmatism decrease with age in your experience? Yes, if you look at why astigmatism, astigmatism is normally not a part of our normal physiology. Astigmatism only occurs when there is a bad posture, bad head posture, and it keeps on increasing. So for that, you have to, uh, yeah, after the age of two or three years, that astigmatism, the optical system, that becomes permanent. It, it will not reduce after the age of three. In, in my clinic, I've seen that till the age of three, if you improve the posture, if you remove the gadgets, because these gadgets in, in a child's hand, they are ruining their postures. Because the child, uh, the first uh, instinct is to hold it close. I don't know why. And or the other instinct is to bend down, stoop, and hold it. So that stooping, that leads to pressure on the eyeballs and astigmatism uh, and a bad posture. So if you reduce that, if you get rid of the gadgets in children, astigmatism will stop. And proper okay, so correction. Proper correction. You so have to good. get... Because this the blurred signal is there, I'm sorry, as long as the blurred signal is there in that meridian, that meridian will keep on enlarging. Okay. So this question was asked by optometrist Hena. And now Dr. Nazri is asking, uh, usually our refractionist gives under correction for hypermetropia in the presence of strabismus. Is it the right option? And she says, uh, in addition to it, that this, I think, happens in pre-verbal children. In pre-verbal children, her, her reflection is given under correction. And you should have the answer by now. If they are doing something wrong, you have to correct them. Okay. okay. And there's another question by Dr. Sobia. Parents ask, is watching TV better than phone or is equally bad? Right. Look, what is at a far distance? TV, of course, it's a bigger screen. It needs less accommodation, less convergence because it's at a far distance. So TV is less harmful. Uh, what uh, most people do is they have, uh, they have TVs, uh, the uh, LCD at a higher level so that children can't reach it. 
and then they watch it with a chin up posture and that chin up posture in small children that results in astigmatism because you're watching like this and strain on the back and muscles so that should not be done the screen should be as far away if it's a larger screen so the room should be large so depending upon the length size of the room the screen should be not too big and then screen should be at the eye level children don't should they don't need to do this and number 3 they should sit straight ahead they should not lie down in the bed or lie down on the carpet at an angle and watch the screen so that is harmful so this is all very you know common sense so but the parents they need to be educated so it's it's we who have to do that anything else i don't see any more questions <laughs> Okay, there's one more coming up uh, by Dr. Nazri. Uh, sorry, I joined late. Myopia with exot. Okay, no, that's okay. I don't see the question there. Myopia with exotropia and preverbal children. My dear, you have to uh, see the whole lecture, and then you will get the answer. Exotropia, you have to uh, give the full correction minus correction. That's it. So far, yes. No more questions. <laughs> okay then. Thank you so much for Thank joining in and participating, and Dr. Fatma and Thank Mr. Daniel. I'm so grateful. Okay, Thank you very so much, Dr. Mehta. I will upload it. If you have any more questions under the YouTube, you can place your comments, and I will try to answer the questions. If you are in my study group, we can discuss it there. So it's up to you. Thank you, Mr. Daniel. So nice. Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. Okay then, Allah Hafiz. Yes, Allah Hafiz.